in Stanga, Guatuguza, uh, the city of, not the city, actually the town of the late great king Shara Zulu. It's all because it's coming from the coast of Izinkwazi Beach, also Stanga Beach as well, you know, we're on the coastal area. Ulanda still sweli. I still think I'm going to go to the coast of Izinkwazi Beach. Right. What's your name? Yes, I'm going to go to the coast of Izinkwazi Oh, po ukuzwa yawan. Inspired by a friend. How? Uba ika malakon. No time to bat. Po, why uno PS kuzwa na? This is was for we had to wear the same thing, so I had to take this because I was wearing a blazer today. Oh, okay. She's trying to make sure that she maintains the look, keep looking good. I like that about staying high. So, what is your question for our teacher and student, Amplan? What happens in an electrolytic cell? Well, great. Let's just repeat that question for our viewers at home. Now ask, what happens inside an electrolytic cell? Okay. Now, as we've said, we're going to be discussing electrochemistry in the following three weeks. But in today's lesson, we are going to take a look at our electrolytic cell. And it forms part of our electrochemistry that takes a look at the transformation between your electrical energy as well as your chemical energy. Now, we're going to be taking a look at two cells. We're going to have your electrolytic cell as well as your galvanic cell. But we'll do the galvanic cell next week. For this week, let's take a look at the electrolytic cell. Now, inside our electrolytic cell, there's going to be a process called electrolysis. And what this means is it's going to be the chemical decomposition that's produced by passing an electrical current through a solution that contains ions. Now, this solution that contains ions is what we're going to be calling our electrolyte solution. Now, I'm sure you've heard about the word electrolyte before. Let's just quickly take a look at a definition as well. It's a solution that contains ions that can be decomposed by passing an electrical current through it. Great. Now, let's go and put this electrolytic cell for us on a diagram. We're going to be using our salt solution, which is also known as brine. Now, we're going to have sodium chloride, that's your normal table salt, that will be dissolved inside of water. But when salt dissolves in water, it's going to break up into its ions, which in this case is going to be sodium ions as well as chloride ions. Now, apart from just this solution, we're going to be placing electrodes inside the solution. And these electrodes are usually made up of a substance that can conduct electricity. Now, we're going to be using carbon. Carbon or graphite electrodes is going to be our specific electrode in this situation. Okay, now do take note that we are going to connect these electrodes to a power source or a cell. Now, one side of this power source or cell is going to be positively charged and the other side will be negatively charged. So that means the electrode that's connected to the negative of the cell will be negatively charged because my electrons will be moving away from the negative and they will start accumulating onto this electrode. On the other hand, your positive will be attracting electrons towards itself and that means it's going to be moving the electrons away from the electrode and there will be a shortage of my negative electrons making it thus positively charged. Okay, so we've got our sodium ions, that's positively charged, chloride ions, that's negatively charged, and that means that my positive sodium ions will be attracted to my negative electrode, whereas my negative chloride ions is going to be attracted to the positive electrode. Okay, now that's going to bring about a reaction, and these reactions is going to come from your redox table. Now you're going to be getting two redox tables in the exams. One's going to be called 4A and the other one's going to be called 4B. The one that you need to use is 4B. And although I don't have the full redox table for you on the screen, just because it's just too big enough for us to work with, your redox table, that's 4B, is going to be starting with lithium. That means Li. It's going to start with lithium. That's almost like lift me up. So you can memorize it like that. And that's the one that you need to use. Okay, now we're going to have sodium ions and chloride ions. Now you're going to take a look at your redox table almost like a school photograph. It's got a whole bundle of kids with different faces on it. And you're going to be looking for specific faces. And our specific faces is the sodium ion, that means Na+. So let's go and take a look for it. Yes, there we can have Na+. And then we have chloride, which is Cl-. Good. Now, you would have noted, though, when you take a look at your redox table here, that your sodium, your Na+, started on the left-hand side of your redox table. That means you're going to need to start to read it from the left-hand side, going over to the right-hand side. And if you take a look at the chloride here at the bottom, it's starting on the right-hand side and being read to the left-hand side. Now, whenever we read it from left to right, we're going to be calling this the reduction half reaction. And whenever we take a look at your table and we read it from right to left, then it's going to be our oxidation half reaction. Okay, so going from left, rather from right to left, we're going to be having our oxidation. 
Now what we're going to be doing with these two half reactions is we're going to be writing out our overall or our net cell reaction. But in order to get there, we're going to need two half reactions. So these reactions on the redox table are all half reactions. And when you're going to read or copy them and paste them back into your oxidation and reduction half reactions, then you're going to just copy and paste whatever is on that redox sheet. So now starting here with my oxidation half reaction, it starts on the right hand side, that's our chloride. Note though that there is a two in the front, but please don't be worried about the twos, they're just there to make sure that the reaction balances out. Okay, now you would have noted though that you've got a double arrow inside of your redox table please do not copy the double arrow when you're going to write down your half reactions. You're going to use only single arrows when you copy it. Good, so let's quickly do this. Chloride, and then it goes to form chlorine gas, which is Cl2 gas, plus two electrons. Taking a look at my reduction half reaction, this was my sodium ions, and they had an electron added to them to give them sodium metal. Good, perfect. Now, in order to go and get our overall cell reaction, the thing for redox reactions is that the electrons must completely cancel out. That means they must also cross cancel each other out. Only something on the right hand side can cancel with something on the left hand side. Now if I take a look at my two half reactions, I've got on my right hand side here two electrons and on my left hand side I've got one. But they won't be able to completely cancel each other out. So we're going to need to multiply something with this electron to get it to two and most probably we'll end up multiplying this whole reaction here with two to end up with two electrons and once it's two then they can completely cancel each other out. Okay now once we've done that what we now need to do is to write my overall cell reaction and we'll do so by adding everything on my left hand side and everything on my right hand side. So we end up having, oops there we go, two chloride ions plus two sodium ions and then from here onwards we're going to have our chlorine gas together with our two sodium metals that formed. Good, now let's go and take a look at some of our characteristics of my electrolytic cells. We're going to notice that it's going to convert electrical energy into chemical energy and that's always going to be the case and we were able to see that when we take a look at our diagram because we had to have a power source that was our electrical energy that brought about this chemical change that made the chloride move in one direction and the sodium ion move in another direction. The second type of thing is it's a non-spontaneous reaction which means it's not going to occur by itself you're going to need to put in energy before this reaction is going to happen and we were able to see that because if we take a look at our redox table again we find that the reduction half reaction was above my oxidation half reaction and whenever that's the case it means it is going to be non-spontaneous if you have oxidation above reduction then you'll have a spontaneous reaction Good, so that means obviously we'll need to have a cell or battery to give electrical energy to this electrolytic cell and we will later on when we do our cell potential calculations realize that whenever we have a negative cell potential it means that we are going to end up though with a non-spontaneous reaction. Good, now oxidation though remember that always occurs at the anode but in an electrolytic cell it's going to occur at the positive electrode and in the case of your reduction which is going to happen at the cathode always that will occur always at the negative electrode but please never memorize that oxidation is the positive and reduction is the negative because that will swap around when we're going to do our galvanic cells a bit later okay sasa khona vele kusikole sami banga phezulu sitenga hayi in kwadukuza ha ngile kungisho ngithi ka slamla eh shompe thu uba wakaba so so bona siphamandla mhlongo yeah, yeah. Oh, What is your question for our teacher in the studio? My learner question for today is, how can I determine from the cell potential value whether it was spontaneous or non-spontaneous reaction? Oh, welcome back. Let's quickly just repeat that question for our viewers at home. They ask, how do I determine from the cell potential value whether it was a spontaneous or a non-spontaneous reaction? 
Okay, now we have seen though in our previous part of this lesson that if you have your oxidation and half reaction above the reduction, then we do have a spontaneous reaction. And if reduction was below oxidation, or rather above oxidation, then you had non-spontaneous. But now let's go and take a look at your cell potential calculation and how you from that can determine whether it was spontaneous or non-spontaneous. Now you're going to be receiving three formulas on your formula sheet at the back. Now note though that these four, three formulas means exactly the same thing. Whether you use any one of the three, you're going to get to exactly the same answer at the end. Now let's just quickly break them down. You'll notice the first one says your E cell is equal to E cathode minus E anode. Now you do know that at the cathode we have reduction occurring and at the anode oxidation. So we can just as well go and say E cell is equal to E reduction minus E oxidation or you can also further on go and say but we know that our oxidizing agent undergoes reduction as well as the fact that our reducing agent undergoes oxidation. So that means actually you don't need to go and study these ones. You can just by taking a look at your formula sheet realize that whenever I've got the cathode reduction is going to occur that's also known as my oxidizing agent and when I've got the anode oxidation is going to occur and that's known as the reducing agent. Now let's go and make use of this specific formulas in one of our examples. We're going to be having a reaction as you can see on your screen that's going to say zinc plus copper ions is going to give me zinc ions plus copper metal. Now whenever you have things like your zinc and your copper standing by themselves it's usually in a zero phase. Now we don't include or zero state rather. And we're not going to include this we're just going to leave it as is. Now you'll note though that your zinc is going to go from this zero charge to a Z in two plus charge and your copper will go from the copper two plus to your zero charge as well. Now when we're going to take a look at our redox table and determine what half reactions is going to take place with their values, we're going to need to look for these specific faces in our redox table. Now let's take a look. Once again, I did not give you the whole redox table, there's just enough enough space for it, but if I'm going to go and look for my zinc, note that it must be zinc without a charge at the top, we'll find this on my right hand side. On the other hand, if I go and take a look at my copper, Copper 2 plus going to copper is on my left hand side. Now do take note though that we're going to be using the values next to them. Now independent of whether you read the reaction from left to right or right to left, you're going to keep these values with these specific signs as is when we transfer it now to our formula. Good. So we're going to use the E reduction minus E oxidation and that means my reduction which was the copper because it started on my left hand side is going to be positive 0.34 minus negative 0.76 and that gives me a positive 1.1 volts which means it's going to be a spontaneous reaction.